now we have conservatives and the NRA saying, yes, uh, uh, what are we going to ban feet too? Because you could kick people. Ha ha ha. That's so funny. All right, we'll get to that story a little bit later in the program. Uh, and then uh, new levels of fake news have infiltrated Google and Facebook. That's in the second hour. That is, look, you know what I like? I like being constructive. I don't like to just do a critique and leave it at that. I, I want to help try to figure out what the right answers are. In terms of fake news, it is a super hard question, and I'm not sure that there are any great answers. But I want to talk about it in the second hour. I want you to join that conversation, send us tweets, use YouTube Super Chat, uh, etc. Uh, that's how we get better, by talking to one another. All right, let's start the show. Okay. It is 13 days after Hurricane Maria hit, and finally the president has decided to go down to Puerto Rico. Now, it's not nearly as important to have the president down there as it is to have help down there. And over the weekend, uh, not only government officials, including the mayor of San Juan, uh, were noting that, uh, that the United States was not helping nearly as much as it could. Uh, its own territory in Puerto Rico, uh, there's a a ship that is designed specifically for these kind of missions, it was sent nine days after the hurricane. Oftentimes that ship is usually sent before the hurricanes because we know they're coming. It was sent tremendously late. All the American generals on the ground were saying, uh, we need more resource here, we don't have enough. Uh, and some news organizations did a wonderful job breaking down how little resources were sent uh, to Puerto Rico vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Florida and, and Houston, who were also just hit with hurricanes. So, uh, with that background, Donald Trump, of course, was mad at his critics, because lives lost, that's, I guess, somewhat relevant. Um, hurricane damage, whatever. But if you have insulted the dear leader, that's a serious issue. And he said uh, in a tweet over the weekend about Puerto Ricans, they want everything to be done for them when it should be a community effort. Why don't you just call him lazy while you're at it? Uh, the guy's a living, breathing, stereotype uh, machine, and I'm being kind there. Uh, but I won't as we continue to go forward. And then he called his uh, critics, potentially including the mayor of San Juan, uh, quote, politically motivated ingrates. Like, what? how dare you? Uh, if I give you the crumbs off my table, you're supposed to like it. Uh, one of our generals down there was in charge of... Uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, efforts, when asked about those comments, uh, said uh, the mayor of San Juan is uh, sleeping on a cot, uh, working around the clock. Donald Trump is playing golf, enough said. So he doesn't actually have support from the people on the ground, including the folks we sent uh, to help, but that's not going to stop Donald Trump. So what's he going to do? He's going to double down, he's going to triple down, he's going to finally go into uh, Puerto Rico now. But he can't help himself because being racist is in his DNA. And I don't mean that that it's a genetic or biological thing. It's just that he grew up with it and, and he doesn't even know he's being racist. If you told him, and, we, and by the way, the media did, and his critics did, and he said, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm from Puerto Rico. And there's some great, I'm from New York. And there's some great Puerto Ricans in New York. And he thinks, what, I know a couple of Puerto Ricans, that's okay, how can I be possibly be racist? I mean, they're lazy, they're ingrates, and, you know, and they won't work for themselves after a hurricane knocks out all the power in their island. But, you know, what do you mean racist? I don't know what you're talking about, right? So the most important thing for him is to protect his own ego. So before he goes to Puerto Rico, a couple of reporters ask him questions. Let's, let's hear what he has to say. She's come back a long way, and, uh, you know, I think it's now acknowledged what a great job we've done, and people are looking at that, and in Texas and in Florida, we get an A+, plus. and I'll tell you what, I think we've done just as good in Puerto Rico, and it's actually a much tougher situation, but I will tell you, the first responders, the military, FEMA, they have done an incredible job in Puerto Rico, and whether it's her or anybody else, they're all starting to say it. I appreciate very much the governor and his comments. He has said we have done an incredible job, and that's the truth. This is about Puerto Rico and the people suffering there, but you have no sense of self, you have no conscience. So I, uh, I think we got an A plus in Houston and Florida, and I think we've done just as well here in Puerto Rico. Hey, hey this is all about me. Why aren't people applauding me? Somebody give me a plus. Please clap. So you want to know what the reality is? Let me quote uh, Tony Pone's memo here and Bloomberg. According to Bloomberg, 
um, quote, almost all private homes and businesses were without power as of Monday, and half the island was still without access to water and sewage treatment. That's a dozen days after the hurricane hit. Uh, we're getting an A+. Plus. Everybody's talking about how great I am, okay? Who cares about the people suffering in Puerto Rico? Let's talk about me and how wonderful I am. What a monster this guy is. Here, another one. Uh, but now the roads are clear. Communication starting to come back. We need their truck drivers. Their drivers have to start driving trucks. We have to do that. So on a local level, they have to give us more help. Okay, you're not going to be surprised to find out that the roads are not clear. Uh, again, our guys on the ground, and I say, look, everybody on the ground is ours, first of all. It's Puerto Rico. It's part of America. I know that's probably news to Donald Trump. But when I say our guys, I mean our troops that we sent and other uh, first responders we sent uh, from the mainland to go help them. They're saying the roads are not cleared. They're not cleared. They, they, we've got, like, I just told you. Almost all of the homes and businesses are without power, and, and half of uh, the island doesn't have access to water or sewage treatment. It's like, no, the roads are cleared, and we're doing fantastic. The problem is, their truck drivers don't want to drive. Oh, for God's sake. Okay, first of all, of course he made that up. There's not one news report about how truck drivers are like, well, the roads are clear, but I'm lazy. I'm a lazy Puerto Rican, so I don't want to drive her out. Okay, of course they're not going to say that. There's no news reports of them not willing to drive. It's a thing he made up. Why? Because he can't help himself. He thinks Puerto Rico, lazy. So I'm just going to say it's not my fault, it's their fault. They're suffering. I didn't send them help. They should have helped themselves. And by the way, that is the cycle of racism that you see over and over again. You treat minor, the government, people in power, treat minorities worse. Then they're in a bad spot. And then they turn around and blame them for being in a bad spot. Well, a hurricane knocked out the whole goddamn island, all the power on the island. I, I, I don't know how we're supposed to, you know, Houston needed everyone else's help. Superstorm Sandy hit New York, New York, New Jersey, the most powerful place on earth. They needed help. Florida needed help. When Puerto Rico needs help, lazy ingrates won't drive. <laughs> it's their fault. Oh, okay. He's such a bad guy. So that's right before he goes to Puerto Rico. Now he goes to Puerto Rico. And there's a press conference all about, you're going to be shocked to find out, Donald Trump and how great he is. Let's watch. Mick Mulvaney is here, right there, and Mick is uh, in charge of a thing called budget. Now, I hate to tell you, Puerto Rico, but you've thrown our budget a little out of whack. <laughs> because we've spent a lot of money on Puerto Rico, and that's fine. We've saved a lot of lives. This is joke time. This is, I mean, and I'm being kind there. I don't think he's really joking. You're throwing our budget out of whack. Now i got to come down here and help these guys who won't help themselves. And i got to spend money on it. Houston, Florida, those are good Americans. I mean, we spend money on that. That makes sense. He never said Florida and Houston throw our budget out of whack. But just when it comes to Puerto Rico, because why? Because he thinks, i got to help these guys. Why don't we just give them some goddamn bootstraps? I can, we have to help them, of course. Of course we do. Just, yeah, it's affecting our budget. Even if you thought, no, Jake, you're being unfair. He's just joking around. You think that's a good time to joke around? You go down there and you've got uh, all these people hurt, injured, killed, and this island is absolutely devastated. The president finally comes down and says, hey, you're throwing our budget out of whack. <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck. Uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, now back to Donald Trump. Every death is a horror. But if you look at a real catastrophe like Katrina, and you look at the tremendous hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that died. And you look at what happened here with really a storm that was just totally overpowering. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Uh, what, is your, what is your death count as of this moment? 17? 16, 16 people certified. 16 people versus in the thousands. Uh, you can be very proud of all of your people, all of our people working together. 16 versus literally thousands of people. Uh, you can be very proud. Everybody around this table and everybody watching can really be very proud of what's taken place in Puerto Rico. He's keeping count, man. Uh, no, it's okay. Hurricane Katrina killed uh, lots and lots of people. This didn't kill as many people, so I win. I win. Uh, Hurricane Katrina. Now, that was a real catastrophe. So they screwed that up. I handled it better because only 16 people died. 
Uh, everybody's telling us that so we've been doing wonderful. Right? Right? Everybody around the table? You want me to give you federal government aid? Just tell me how wonderful I am, right? So only 16 people died. I mean, this is not a big deal. Hurricane Katrina was a big deal. But this we handled wonderfully. Monster through and through. More. The governor has been who I didn't know. I heard very good things about him. He's not even from my party. And he started right at the beginning appreciating what, what we did. Right from the beginning, this governor did not play politics. He didn't play it at all. He was saying it like it was. And he was giving us the highest grades. And I want to, on behalf of our country, I want to thank you. Okay, this governor. Did he do a good job of rescuing people? I don't know, and I don't care. I mean, in the previous answer, I came down to Puerto Rico. I didn't know how many people died. I didn't bother. I'm the, he's the president of the United States. Didn't ask someone, hey, before I go to the press conference, hey, can you tell me how many people died? Was it 17? Was it what is it? What was it? Was it 16? Was it 16? Uh, Hurricane Katrina, that was terrible. There was hundreds or thousands. You're the president. You have all the resources in the world. Just ask someone before you go to the press conference, hey, how many people died in Hurricane Katrina? How many people uh, died in this hurricane? Do you want to do like one second of homework? No. And do you care about the 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 cleanup, the getting actually getting the roads clear, all that stuff? No, no. This guy, he's giving us good grades. I like this guy. He compliments me every once in a while. Oh yeah, feeds my ego. That's why I like this guy. Why were we here again? I forgot. One more. It's an honor to work with you folks, and we'll all get it done together. So I appreciate your support, and I know you appreciate our support, because uh, our country's really gone all out to help. And uh, it's not only dangerous, it's expensive, it's everything, but uh, I consider it a great honor. I know you appreciate our support, right? Sounds like a mafia boss. Tell me you appreciate our support in these times when it's really expensive, and I still have to take care of you people. It's a United States territory. You're the president of the United States. It's not optional. It is your duty to take care of them. It's okay, but hey, have you thanked me enough? Because if you haven't thanked me enough, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you guys are in grace. I mean, you're not even helping yourself. But don't worry. Daddy's here, okay? I'm going to take care of things. As long as you guys all give me good grades and say wonderful things about me. In fact, here, one last clip, actually. And, and, and I'm going to spare you the end where he makes the different politicians go around the room thanking him. Okay, he, but this is the beginning of that. Watch. So, Congresswoman Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, who I uh, watched the other day, and she was saying such nice things about all of the people that have worked so hard. Hey, Jennifer, do you think you could say a little bit what you said about us uh, today? And it's not about me. It's about these incredible people from the military to FEMA to first responders. I mean, I've never seen people working so hard in my life. Well, I want to thank you because you were really generous. And, and I saw those comments and everybody saw those comments and we really appreciate it. Now, yeah, when you make good comments about me, I noticed that. All right, now, everybody, and he went around the room, and he made the different people say, oh, Donald Trump is great, and uh, we, we really appreciate his support, and we think and he was walking around with a baseball bat behind him the whole time. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Okay, but come on, guys. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I guess his supporters think that's all wonderful, and they probably think like him, that, yeah, they're Puerto Ricans. They're lucky we helped them at all. I mean, are they really Americans? They're down in Puerto Rico. And they probably share the same biases as Trump does, uh, but he has no sense of empathy and helping others. He goes down to Puerto Rico. It's not that hard a job. It's basically a photo op where you just have to just show some degree of sympathy. Like Mike Pence is a standard politician. He goes down uh, to these areas after Trump goes, and he just he does this the little wince thing that he does, the, the, the fake concern. Like, okay, that's it. That's all we're asking for. I don't care that it's fake. At least pretend you care about those people and do this, right? But Trump can't help himself. There's no this in him. There's no empathy in him. Now, everybody, let's go around the room. I mean, I'm doing fantastic, right? I'm an A+. Plus. Hey, everybody, tell me what an A+, plus I am. How many people died here? Well, I don't I didn't bother checking. I don't give a damn about you guys. Let's go back to me. Let's go back to me. I mean, we're doing wonderful. This is better than Hurricane Katrina. I do hurricanes better than the, uh, Bush did them. I'm, I'm winning with my hurricanes. You guys were a mess with your hurricanes. Monster through and through. Here's, uh, 
I watched the whole thing. So there's um, pieces of it. Obviously, the governor uh, that he had is sitting right to his right because he's always been so nice to him. You're you're by my right. You're going to be in the shot the whole time. It was placement for the favored ones, right? Um, the the mayor of San Juan, uh, Mayor Cruz, who's been he's getting the battles back and forth with. She's off to the side. And actually, when the governor mentioned everyone, especially people with mayors in parts of, the, of other parts of the country, and we're helping out with this, he didn't look her way. He looked back at him like he did not acknowledge her. And as part of the victory tour of telling the congresswoman to say nice things and repeat them and asking the governor to repeat the nice things, he said he did not ask Mayor Cruz, hey, can you repeat some of the nice things you said on me? Because there were no nice things said about him. That lady did not exist in that entire time. <laughs> so it's it was the preferred ones. You're right next to me because you've always been so nice to me. I didn't know this guy, but now I know him because he said those nice things about me. Yeah, and that's another thing. I mean, to brag about how you didn't know the governor of Puerto Rico earlier, why don't you just shut your mouth about it? And and look, guys, it's one thing if you're doing political battle and you're and you're playing hardball and you say, hey, you don't vote with me on health care and you're not going to get to sit next to me on an important photo op. I get it. That's part of politics. I always think that it's hilarious that politicians care about that, right? But they do because they got to see themselves on TV. They got to get their names on, etc. So they care deeply about it. And both Democrats and Republicans do this. They'll stand for hours uh, before the State of the Union to get their first, uh, you know, when the president first comes in to shake his hand so they're on TV. Like politicians are so cheesy. Okay, but now is not the time for that. And when they need help, so they could rescue people is not the time for that kind of politics. But there is, there's, <laughs> Trump has no off switch on Monster. So now is always the time for him. All right, let's keep going. Let's go to guns. Okay. Um, now, Republicans love to say, there's nothing we can do about gun control, man. I mean, uh, all these mass shootings, these massacres, the largest one in modern history happened yesterday in Las Vegas. 59 killed over the, uh, the night before. 59 killed, over 500 injured. And the Republicans' answer to it is, I don't know. Uh, why? Because they get paid by the NRA to not do anything. So uh, they're deeply corrupt, uh, and they don't mind playing with your lives. Uh, so, uh, But they can't say that, so what are they going to say? Oh, mental illness. Now, do we know if this guy was mentally ill or not? Nah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's our st standard excuse. But you're going to want to wait to see what the reality is. First, they ask uh, Paul Ryan, hey, are you going to do anything about this? I mean, when one person dies from terrorism in the country, that is really important. We all go to do something about it. And Paul Ryan and, Tr and Trump go out there, oh, my God, the fix this, the travel ban, and the you know, more bombings and stuff. 59 people died. No, I'm not going to do anything about it. But they've got their standard excuse. So go ahead, Paul. What's your excuse? Yeah, I think one of the um, one of the things we've learned from these shootings is that often underneath this is a diagnosis of mental illness. This is why we spent years working on mental illness with reform, uh, Congressman Murphy's bill, and that's why the House Representative passed landmark mental health reform just a year ago. That law is now being implemented. So I think it's important that as we see the dust settle and we see what was behind some of these tragedies, that mental health reform is a critical ingredient to making sure that we can try and prevent some of these things from happening in the past. So that's just one example of the things that Congress has done to make sure that we can try and get ahead of these problems. Oh, no, don't do anything about guns. Okay, the guy had 23 guns uh, in, uh, at the hotel. He had 19 at home. Uh, but don't do anything about guns. Did he kill people with mental health? No, he killed them with guns and bullets. But don't do anything about it. But that's okay. Let's pretend to do something about mental health. But wait a minute. I thought there was a bill about mental health. And that you actually prevented people having their guns taken away if they have mental health issues. Well, anyway, well let's find out. Because a couple of reporters are going to ask him. Watch. Oh, I'm going to make it easier for him. Yep. Uh, Nicholson. Um, roll back the uh, proposed rule like the Social Security to cross check uh, people whose uh, benefits are being the third parties that they consider them to uh, to allow that cross check to go mixed back then. Yeah, there, there were people who were who, whose rights were being infringed, and that wasn't just, it, it was, it's a little more complicated than you than you described. <laughs> Protecting people's rights uh, was, was very important, and that's what that, that issue was all about. So, 
Wait, you said that the one thing you were doing about this was to make sure that we do something about mental health reform. Uh, and then the reporters pointed out, no, you actually made it easier for people who are mentally ill to get guns. It's like, oh, that's complicated. Complicated. So, no, no. So you were just, you did the exact opposite of what your only excuse is. Your excuse is mental health. So let me go back to uh, earlier this year, go to NBC News and show you what actually happened back then. This was in February. President Donald Trump, they explained, quietly signed a bill into law Tuesday, rolling back an Obama-era regulation that made it harder for people with mental illnesses to purchase a gun. So Obama had made it harder for people with mental illness, serious, serious mental illness, to purchase a gun. Trump rolled it back. Paul Ryan, the House and the Senate, helped them to roll the bang up. Mentally ill people, they should get guns. Well, here, I'll give you more details. The rule, which was finalized in December, added people receiving social security checks for mental illnesses and people deemed unfit to handle their own financial affairs to the National Background Check Database. So I'll give you further clarity on that. So they said, look, we've got this database where you need to do a check, and if, and if somebody's got issues... Uh, and, you know, how the NRA is whittled that database down. If you're on the terrorist watch list, you can still buy a gun in America. <laughs> the degree of insanity of that is unimaginable. Gee, oh, there's nothing we can do. How about we don't let the guys on the terrorist watch list have a gun? Uh, no, no, they got rights. Terrorists have rights. That's Republicans protecting terrorist rights. Well, some people on the list are, uh, are not exactly right. Sometimes maybe up to 3% could be wrong. How about the 97% that are right? How about you fix the 3% instead of saying let all the terrorists have guns. But in this case, it's about mental illness, their number one excuse. And uh, this is for a category of people that are getting Social Security, but they cannot, they have been adjudicated to be so mentally ill that you can't trust them with their own money. They need someone to handle their financial affairs for them, so you can't even give them a Social Security check. The Republicans said and passed a law saying, even though they're not mentally fit to handle a single dollar, we want them to be able to buy guns. And then you have the nerve to go out on a press conference and say, we shouldn't do anything about guns, but we should do something about mental health. Those are sometimes, and it's, it's not a judgment on them, just who they are. And, and we, I want to have more mental health reform to help those folks. But you think a guy who can't be trusted with a single dollar, the government has adjudicated it. Their family and friends have asked, don't give him a dollar. He doesn't know how to spend it. Give him a gun. Give him a gun. No, no, these guys, they're so corrupt. It's not that they're just, I mean, it's not, I, it's easy to joke around and say, well, they're mentally ill. They're not, they're not. They're just corrupt and they don't care about your lives. As long as they get that NR, NRA check, they don't give a damn about you and your loved ones. If you get shot by someone who's mentally ill, take it, whatever, let's go to our steak dinner. Here, I'm going to give you more details. Both the House and Senate last week passed a new bill, H.J. Resolution 40, revoking the Obama-era regulation. Trump signed the bill into law without a photo op or fanfare. On the same day, back in February, he actually did a huge photo op for other bills that he signed and other executive orders that he signed. But when it came to that, they're like, uh, they put it in a footnote. Why? Because they know that what they did was important. They know they did it for the NRA checks. So they didn't want a photo op of Trump signing that because they know that the next time somebody who's mentally ill shoots someone, people are going to say, hey, wait a minute, didn't you want the mentally ill to have guns? And so they don't want a photo op of that. They have no conscience whatsoever. <sighs> At the time, one last quote from NBC News. The National Rifle Association, quote, applauded Trump's action. I wonder if they're still applauding. So the next time you see a Republican out there, or a Democrat who is also funded and bribed by the NRA, talking about how there's nothing we can do, oh, the real issue is mental health, know that they are lying through their teeth, they are the swamp, they are the corrupted, they just took the money, and they said, yes, we don't care how mentally ill you are. We don't even care if you're a terrorist. As long as our gun manufacturers that pay our campaign donations are making money off of your death, you have at it, Hoss. 
give them the guns, give them whatever, whether they're mentally ill or terrorists, and if they kill you or your loved ones, we don't care as long as we catch the check. That's who Paul Ryan is. Okay. I hope I was clear enough on that. Now, uh, let's go to uh, another important Republican and his uh, talking points on this and what the Republicans have been doing on a national scale on these issues. Okay. Jason Chaffetz uh, was a Republican congressman, and uh, he was supposed to uh, be do oversight of President Trump. He thought that job was so um, disastrous that he fled Congress and into the open arms of Fox News, where he's now a contributor. And he is paid to go out there and uh, cover Republican asses. And in this case, uh, since uh, they think giving away can uh, guns like candy is a great idea, uh, and... Oh, look, we had yet another massacre, the largest in modern history, and all these people are dead. Well, Fox News is going to trot out Jason Chaffetz to say, there's nothing we can do. I'm going to tell you what the reality is and what they actually did after we watch. Let's watch. Is there anything in your mind that could have been done to prevent something like that from happening? I don't know of a single thing that would have prevented this uh, this evil that possessed this person and to do this atrocity. I, I, I wish there was something that I could do to go back in time and just make sure that it never happened. But, um, you know, it, let, let's grieve for those that are affected by this. People are, as the speaker said, are, you know, fighting for their lives. You got parents and loved ones who are just finding out that somebody was killed, for goodness sake. It's just not the time to dive into the politics and try to score political points on this topic. It's just not. I do think that background checks um, will obviously become an issue. I do think there's something we can do with on the mental health uh, front, but again, I, I think it's too early to do that, and it wouldn't necessarily have, have prevented what uh, tragically happened in Las Vegas. So look, we can go through the standard stuff of if it's too early for Las Vegas, can we do something about what happened in San Bernardino? Can we do something about what happened in Orlando? Can we do something about the cop shootings that happened? That was also a mass shooting in, in Dallas, in Louisiana. Uh, can we do uh, something about a mass shooting that happens every single day in America? On average, more than one a day last year and just about one a day this year where four people are shot uh, and injured and or killed in one shooting. That's a mass shooting. One per day in America. If it's too early for Las Vegas, can we just go back a week earlier, you'll find another mass shooting. A day earlier, you'll find a mass shooting. A month earlier, you'll find 30 mass shootings in that month. When is it ever time? And the reality is, Jason Chaffetz is just as corrupt as all of his colleagues, and he takes NRA money, and he is a corrupt harlot of industry, okay? And so uh, he got all of his checks, now he's getting checks from Fox News, so he says, oh, golly gee, I wish I could go back in time and do something. Actually, you could have done something. You were a congressman. You could have voted for gun regulation. You could have voted for federal background checks, which 93% of Americans agree with. It's not a left-right issue. Even CNN does, oh, it's a left-right issue. The left says this, the right says that. No, 93% of Americans, unless you want to acknowledge that 93% of Americans are the left wing. They all say we should do federal background checks. No, Ch Chaffetz votes no. All of his Republican colleagues vote no. Joe Manchin and other corporate Democrats, they vote no. So there is something you could have done. He talks about evil. I'm not going to get into who's really evil. Okay, so uh, let's look at the guns uh, in this case. Uh, these are pictures now from uh, the hotel room of uh, the shooter uh, at Mandalay Bay. So there's all the bullets flying around. Uh, obviously some heavy-duty uh, weaponry there. There's more. Uh, let me give you the details. Uh, he had five handguns, two shotguns, a plethora of ammunition, as the authorities said, 42 guns total in the room and in his house. Uh, the, in his hotel room specifically, he had 23 weapons, one rifle outfitted with a bump stock, thousands of rounds of ammunition, ingredients used in explosives in his car. I wish there was something we could do, but there's nothing we can do. We just had to let him buy all those weapons. And we had to let him buy weapons where he could fire uh, a seemingly endless number of bullets. Well, there's something you could do. You could actually limit the number of bullets in a magazine. That's legislation that has been proposed. Oh, no, 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 not going to do that. Every American has the right to fire hundreds of bullets at once so they can massacre people uh, more easily. Wait, I thought this was for hunting or self-protection. If there's a robber in your house, do you really need to fire 200 bullets at him? If there's a deer in the woods, do you really need to fire? Are you that bad a shot? you got to fire 200 bullets at him? Okay, or 100 or 30. 
no, 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 no. The Founding Fathers wanted us to have uh, as high a weaponry as we can. They had muskets. What do they know about fully automatic or semi-automatic weapons? So, anyway, I don't want to get back into the Second Amendment and the nonsense interpretation of the insane right wing. But, Chavez says there's nothing we do. But now, to be fair to him, we actually did go back in time. Uh, the Hill did a wonderful story about how actually legislators throughout the country at the state level have been taking action on the issue of guns. Okay, great. My bad. Let's find out what they did. Um, the new laws, all passed this year, include measures that will allow gun owners to carry weapons without a special permit, as well as carry those weapons in places like daycare facilities, official state buildings, and on college campuses. Oh, they made it much worse. Now, not all of them were bad. I'm going to give you two instances of positive gun control laws in the country, and then I'm going to give you the nightmare that is America, unfortunately, on this issue. Oregon legislators allowed residents concerned about family members or friends to seek an extreme risk protection order, which would block an individual with mental health issues from obtaining a weapon. Hey, there it is. Uh, actual progressive legislators uh, in Oregon went and did something about mental health. What Republicans claim they're going to do, but never ever do. So, And if Republicans voted for that bill, however few of them did, bless their hearts. Okay, Because it isn't about partisan. I don't give a damn about Republicans or Democrats. All I care about is policy. So it's not the time for politics. What is politics for? It's for policy. Okay, And policy is whether we're going to get massacred by these guys or not going to get massacred. Alright, one more good news. Legislators in eight states, Rhode Island, Louisiana, Maryland, Nevada, New Jersey, North Dakota, Tennessee, and Utah, and notice, by the way, blue and red states in there, that's good news, passed new measures to curb gun ownership for those who have been convicted of domestic abuse. Okay, that's the good news, that's all there is. Now let's go to the bad news. After Republicans claimed control of Iowa state legislature in 2016 elections, lawmakers this year passed the most sweeping package of gun rights laws in the country. The Iowa measure, House File uh, 517, creates a so-called stand-your-ground policy. It also prevents cities from enacting stronger restrictions on gun rights than are permitted under state law. The measure signed by then-Governor uh, Terry Branstad also allows concealed carry holders to enter the state capitol building with their firearms. So, let's break that one down. Okay. Um, so, first of all, uh, stand your ground. Um, eh, <laughs> this, is, this is the insane defense, by the way. During the Trayvon Martin case, I asked one of these um, guys who leads one of the prominent um, gun organizations in America, wait, you say that Zimmerman had, a, uh, had every right to stand his ground because Trayvon Martin was attacking him in your version of the story and that he could shoot Trayvon Martin dead. But we know Zimmerman pursued Trayvon Martin, so didn't Trayvon Martin have a right to stand his ground, but he didn't have a weapon? He said, no, you only have a right to stand your ground if you have a gun. If you don't have a gun, you don't have a right to do anything. You just have a right to get murdered. So in Iowa, they codified it. Yeah, okay, great. And then on top of that, they're like, wait, that's not enough. Let's be further, uh, it, it, further madness. Let's add further madness to this uh, debacle already. Let's let people with guns walk into the Capitol uh, building. <sighs> okay, I, I, I don't want anybody getting hurt. I'm a progressive. But if Republicans, all right, they're they're inviting disaster, man. You know, like, you know how uh, volatile politics is today. A Republican got shot. Steve Scalise got shot, right? And a Democrat got shot. Gabby Giffords. And you know what? People with who are really pissed off about whatever they're pissed off about on either side walk into a a government building with a gun. That's how Harvey Milk got shot. That's how, I mean, how many people have gotten shot that way? Do you know that we have tighter uh, gun control laws in California? Because um, the Black Panthers realized that they had gun rights too. And they walked into a government building in California with guns, which was legal at the time. Boom, immediately they took away gun rights. And they were like, whoa, wait a minute, gun control. But they figure, Iowa, it's okay. It's so white people are going to walk in and... I don't know what they think, but this is this country's lost its frickin' mind, and it's because of the corruption. It's not just because they're stupid. And yes, they're also stupid. I mean, you're going to tell... You pass a law that somebody can walk in with a gun if they don't agree with you. Yes, that's corrupt, but that's also maniacally stupid. Okay, let's go to other places. New Hampshire and North Dakota will eliminate requirements for obtaining a permit for carrying concealed firearms, a measure gun rights advocates call constitutional carry. And the Indiana and Wisconsin legislatures are considering 
similar measures that could move as early as this year. Oh, what do you need a permit for? I mean, you know that almost everywhere in America you need a permit to go fishing. But just to put a little, you know, <laughs> in, in our local lake in New Jersey, I remember somebody was going fishing and I thought, oh, that's cool, I, I wouldn't mind going fishing. They said, whoa, 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 you better get a permit. Okay, you can do the most benign things. You want to improve your garage, you need a permit. You want to do anything, you need a permit, right? A gun, nah, who needs a permit for that? That kills people. Have at it, hoss. And then, what, wait, won't it be harder for the cops to track down who did the killing? Yeah, of course. That'll lead to more gun sales. What do you mean? Yeah, I know. Ohio permit holders will be allowed to carry concealed weapons in daycare facilities and in public parts of airports. Just when you thought they couldn't get any dumber. Those in Wyoming will be allowed to uh, carry firearms in uh, kindergarten through uh, 12th grade. Georgia and Arkansas residents may carry firearms on college and university campuses. Because a drunken frat party is the best place to bring a gun. That's a great idea. Maybe second best place is an airport. <laughs> Third best place might be daycare. Because, you know, those toddlers, you never know what happens. So, I know, I know. Oh, well, you can protect yourself. In case a deranged toddler gets out of control. <sighs> the rest of the world thinks we're lunatics. And looking at these laws, it's hard to argue with them. But, hey, if you don't live in, uh, inside America, you have to understand something you don't. Because you might have corruption in your neck of the woods, but we made corruption systematic. And so, you know, in your country, you might have to actually give cash to a politician and keep it secret and put it in a suitcase or a Swiss bank account or somewhere in Panama or something. No, no, no. In our country, we just made it legal. You could just give money in the form of campaign donations to politicians, and then they work for you. And then they're brazen about it. Like, yeah, I don't care if your kids get shot in daycare. Did you give me a check or did you not? That toddler did not write me a check. The NRA wrote me a check. So from now on, you can go bring guns anywhere you like. <laughs> One more. And in Texas, lawmakers decriminalize possession of suppressors. Now, that's the, the politically correct term for silencers. That's what assassins use. Uh, but no, no, I'm told by gun lovers in America, no, no, you don't understand, man, no, you need that for the hearing. Uh, there's also this you could use for hearing uh, when you're shooting. Oh, right, the things that you put on your ears. Or this. Right, that's how we normally did it. <laughs> you know what you need suppressors for? To murder people and have people not hear it. <laughs> If, no, I need it for the deer. The deer took you. I can't have it secret. So you, you already shot it. You already shot it. Okay. The Justice Department, it never ends. So that was all local and state level. Okay. Now, the Justice Department also ended Operation Choke Point, another Obama-era program aimed at preventing criminal fraud in the gun industry. Who's against preventing criminal fraud in anything? In anything. These are guys who are the ones pretending to be for the rule of law. Uh, the law and order. I mean, unless you're Wall Street, then you do criminal fraud all you like and we're going to let you go. They just uh, are now considering le legislation. We covered this on the show last week. Where they said, no, we're going to let Wall Street regulate itself. If they turn themselves in, they'll have lesser penalties. And then afterwards they said, <laughs> where's my money? Wall Street, where's my money? You give me campaign donations? Okay. You break any law you like. Gun industry, give me money? Break any law you like. Criminal fraud? Have at it, boss. What do I care? Why do they do this? The NRA has been especially active on Capitol Hill this year. After spending millions to elect Trump and Republican members of Congress, the group has spent $3.2 million lobbying Congress during the first half of the year, according to the Center for Responsive Politics. We have legalized bribery in America. And it is literally killing us. Wolf-Pack.com If you don't get money out of politics, this nightmare is never going to end. They're never going to work for us. They're just going to go to the highest bidder. And the NRA has more money than you do, so they're going to allow people with mental health problems to get it, people on the terrorist watch list to get it. They're going to let them bring it into daycare. They're going to let them bring it onto college campuses into state buildings, they're going to airports, they're going to let them bring it anywhere they want because they're going to make money off of it. That's today's America. For God's sake, get us real change, young Turks.
Turks, a couple of quick tweets for you guys. Riley Grady writes, said, motherfucker gonna break both arms patting himself on the back. <laughs> Referring to Trump, obviously. Trey Beatty says, a uh, press conference with Trump in Puerto Rico, quote, this governor, uh, you know he doesn't know the guy's name. <laughs> of course! He didn't bother to find out how many people died down there. You think he knows the governor's name? This governor right here, who I didn't know before. Which he said. Uh, Solby says, I hunt. I've hunted with arrows, slings, shotguns, and rifles. The only thing to hunt with automatic weapons is people. So wrong. Um, thank you. That's exactly right. Uh, so, let's go uh, give you more Puerto Rico and unfortunately more guns. Okay. Uh, Donald Trump's down in Puerto Rico. Uh, he did a, a huge press conference patting himself on the back. We've been wonderful. We've been fantastic. Before he left, he said, we got an A-plus in Houston and Florida. I don't know who gave him that A-plus. The same thing in Puerto Rico, and he made politicians go around the table and pat him uh, on the back. Well, he wasn't done having fun. Here, he's supposed to give out supplies to the people of Puerto Rico. Remember when he went down to Houston, and instead of putting it in the pickup truck, he handed the supplies through the the driver window, they didn't know what to do with him, couldn't drive off. Well, the goofball's at it again, because he thinks, well, 16 people died, 95% uh, of the island doesn't have any power, people can't reach their loved ones, they don't know if they're dead or alive, let's have fun instead. So watch the beginning, which is unbelievable, is he's like a, he thinks he's at a basketball game, hey, everybody gets a t-shirt, or you know he's a reality show host, it kind of reminded me a little bit of everybody gets a car, or, he, or when Tyra did, everybody gets Vaseline, and then listen to what he says at the end, watch. sense of self. He has no sense of conscience. So he's like, there's a lot of love for me here, right? I, I, I threw paper towels at people. People loved it. Hey, hey, look at that. I'm having fun. This one was a three-pointer. There's a lot of love in this room. Ha ha! Is that one of those guys, the blasters that, that blast the t-shirts into the crowd? He's a reality show host. He's a circus clown. That He can't help himself. That's who he is. We elected a clown, so we shouldn't be surprised that he brought us a three-ring circus. Okay, uh, let's go to the next story. So yesterday, after uh, the tragic shootings in Las Vegas, um, I don't know that I'd even call it a prediction, but I kind of made a prediction uh, on Twitter. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. It was mainly an insult uh, uh, I wrote QNRA idiots to say mass shooter in Vegas could have done it with a rope or a knife. High power weapons make mass murder easier. Hashtag gun control. Okay. Um, so I don't know if Dana Loesch, uh, who is uh, NRA spokesperson and supposedly a media figure, she does propaganda for the NRA. Which self-loathing media organization would hire a propagandist like that? I don't know, but I could look it up. I bet you could look it up. Anyway, uh, Dana Loesch is uh, out there to prove me right. So she comes out, tweets the next day, 59 people killed in Las Vegas, over 500 injured. She writes, right after we ban pools, cars, cigarettes, alcohol, hands, feet, and fists, live lo lives lost due to these constitute an epidemic. Is that supposed to be funny? Or are you being serious? Do you think that guy could have punched 59 people to death? Do you think he could have injured 500 people with his feet? Are you making a joke? Or are you really this stupid? You know, what she was responding to was a report by the American College of Physicians saying that this is a public health issue. Of course it is. We have one mass shooting per day in America on average. 
we th- here. I've got the stats for you. Uh, between 2001 and 2014, we had 440,000 firearm deaths. Just a little point of comparison, a little over 3,000 killed in a domestic acts of terrorism. 440,000 people died. That's not a war. That's a giant war. That's, that's like a world war kind of number. That's in 14 years in America. Gun deaths per year, 33,000. Are 33,000 people killed by feet every year? Is that funny? Is that, is that the point you're making, Dana? Mass shootings, 363 mass shootings. I'm sorry, 383 mass shootings in 2016. 15,000 people killed in gun violence. And uh, this year so far in 275 days, this is from yesterday, 273 mass shootings, 11,600 people killed. No, she's unfazed by that. Your family members got murdered? What does she care? She's literally paid to do propaganda for the NRA. So she wants to distract you and make jokes. Aha. Uh-huh. So she writes, it's a health issue, in quotes. Cars, then hand, feet, and fists will be banned first. Also, pools. I literally don't know if she's joking and thinks it's funny that you you had family members who were murdered. Maybe she thinks it's hilarious. Or she is one of the dumbest people alive. She thinks, oh, somebody with their feet or with a pool can drown 59 people and shoot over 500. These weapons make it much, much easier to kill people. You know why? That's what they're designed to do. They are killing machines. Your hands and feet and pools are not the same thing. And you know that, but you're paid to be a shill for the NRA, and I'm being awfully kind when I leave it there. You also know exactly what you are. It's a lot worse than that. Young Turks. I'm going to tell you a story, and then I want you to tell me what you think about the way I reacted to the situation, and if you thought it was acceptable. Guilty. Oh, wait, i got to wait for the story. I know Anna Kasparian has some stuff to say, and the world needs to hear it. But then he became woke back. I, I hate it. it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I used to do this trick where we would elongate the videos so that we would look skinnier. That is the most positive drug dealing story I've ever heard of. Fair. Okay. Don't give a fuck. I trust you guys' audience. Don't let me down. You don't believe in ghosts? I'm not pussy. Oh, uh, don't. Just food and turkey. Have you got spotted TYT? What is this? What's a spot? Oh, no. Did you want to poop outside? No, I poop here. It's fine because I bury it. And you know what happens in that water? Turns frogs gay. And they can't stand the establishment. And then I slipped and fell on my ass. Yes, I gotta get comfortable here. Yeah, that is tomorrow's joke, Jay. When your time is up, what wouldn't you do for just one more day? I'm gonna try to have sex with you. If you don't want it right now, just roll up a newspaper and hit the hottest club I've ever been to is my bedroom. People <laughs> often say that you are the jasmine of TYT. Yeah. Please, I am not with you, baby. You gotta let me go. Oh God, this hurts so bad. You're alive. You're alive. The last day is not any more valuable than today. I got a bunch of things to go through. No Republican would have ever voted for Bernie. He would have done worse than Hillary. Clinton. Ah, ah. They're so miserable. All right, I'm gonna stop myself. So I say things that are so If I ran for office, and that would be a trippy day, right? I'd break even more rules than Trump. If I had all the money in the world, one, uh, I would enjoy that. A great show for you. Please answer is C. Dave's is A, and the correct answer is, of course, B. <laughs> guys are the worst. Here's the story. And it's not funny. <laughs> it seems just comically unfair and ridiculous. The Democratic Party just sucks right now. It just sucks because it doesn't know what it stands for. We should probably be right <laughs> Hey, 
Hey, Jack, what's up? Aaron, did they change the icon for Vine? I can't find it. Okay, we can raise money too and we can spend it against you. 
And when we did that in Connecticut, boy, they cried and cried. But it's not fair that you're spending money. Great, I got a deal for you. Get money out of politics and we're done with it. So the, the drive is wolf-pack.com slash wedding. It started because this lovely, lovely couple uh, decided that as part of their wedding uh, registry, they were going to put Wolfpack in to raise money uh, for a, a cause. And we called it a red, red, white, and blue wedding. And But now for our political opponents, it might just become a red wedding. So either way, uh, that's the URL you go to to help. Uh, we want to raise $100,000 so we can go get the bad guys. And wouldn't it be fun? Uh, look, we've eliminated some in the past. Okay, I'm going to tell you an amazing story about that in a second, but I, I want to show the volunteers too. Um, by the way, if you want to have, as part of your wedding registry or birthday or bar mitzvah or anything else, uh, a, a, an ability to donate to Wolfpack as well, uh, email them at together at wolf-pack.com. Okay? So now I'm going to show you some of the volunteers from Wolfpack and some of the leaders of Wolfpack. So I'm going to show you two videos. The second one is about victory, and that's awesome. The first one is about what they're up to. So I want you to get that context before I tell you what the new campaign is. Here, let's watch. My name is Allison Hartson. I am a national director with Wolfpack. Pop on those 3D glasses, guys, because it's much more crazy. The goal of Wolfpack is to get an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that will allow us to have free and fair elections. It's not the only issue, but it's the first issue, and that's money in politics. The goal of Wolfpack is to get a representative democracy back in this country. The corruption issue affects every other issue. Uh, you name it, you can go down the list, education, the environment, the military, the economy, people at the top that are making the most money are the ones that are dictating all of the rules. That is the antithesis of a democracy. Wolfpack has the most intelligent, uh, plausible way to get money out of politics. We have the logical plan. So what we're trying to do is to use the power that our forefathers gave us in the U.S. Constitution through Article 5. Article 5 is a specific procedure set up in the Constitution to propose amendments to it. You have to work state by state. You need 34 states to make that happen. Vermont, California, Illinois, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. We've passed in those states so far. One of the hardest parts of my job is that I have to follow her. <laughs> Give me a break. My name is Mike Manetta. I am a national director with Wolfpack. We have decided to move Wolfpack from defense to offense. Mm. I'm going to tell you about that offense in a sec. So none of those people have ever worked in politics. They're not politicians. They're not lobbyists. They're citizen warriors. Lobbyists are mercenaries. We're going to run roughshod over them. So before I tell you about the new plan, uh, let me show you one last thing about how we win. Because, you know, the mainstream media sometimes, not sometimes, almost all the time, they're totally oblivious to stuff like this. And they never pay any attention to it. All they do is they keep score with who has more money and who doesn't. <laughs> they reward corruption by talking about, oh, that guy raised a lot of money. He's a legitimate candidate. So the reality is we've already gotten this pass in five states. Here, here, here from them. 23rd day of February 2015 was the day we victoriously passed the resolution, and it really felt like I just walked into a tsunami during its most powerful wave and got to surf that current with the people that ended up changing my life. When we passed in California, that was my first win that I got to personally enjoy. That was amazing. Um, I think I was hooked. <laughs> Officially hooked at that point. I was in Rhode Island when we passed. I was probably there every single day that week, just standing outside, holding up signs, waiting for legislators. Two years of really, really hard work condensed into this one amazing moment of victory. Uh, fulfillment's a hell of a drug, guys. It is, man. Nothing feels better than winning on a righteous cause. So Allison, when she organized the entire state of California, was a teacher in Orange County. Had never, ever done anything in politics before. Eventually, we wound up hiring her. We also wound up hiring the guys who won in Rhode Island. And how do we do that? We did that through fundraisers just like this. Look, you want to volunteer instead? You want to be one of those guys who are the leaders? Fantastic. That's even better. Wolf-pack.com. Do it today. Do it in whatever state you're in. It's going to make a huge difference. If you, if you can't volunteer and you just want to give, whether it's just a little bit of money now or 10 bucks a month, whatever you want, wolf-pack.com. So wh what are we going to do next? Well, like Allison said, we got to go on the offense. So if we get to $100,000, I'm going to announce to you guys who we're going to target. But it's time to move people out. So we've helped people get elected in places like Vermont and other states. 
Uh, we also in New Hampshire uh, got this guy named Valancourt uh, thrown out of office. He was a six-term incumbent, uh, and they thought, he's been in office since the 1990s. How are you guys going to do that? You can't do that. That's impossible. We went door to door. He tabled our resolution and didn't allow a vote on it, so we removed, from, we removed him from office. He lost by 93 votes because we came for him. The night before the election, he ran into Mike Mineta, who you saw there, at a Burger King. And he said to him, are you one of the guys that came for me? It's like out of a movie. By the way, um, a couple of elections later, to be fair, Valancourt uh, got his seat back. And then, unfortunately, he passed away recently. You know what was one of the last things he voted on? He voted to make sure that our resolution got a vote. Politics works. And carrots work, but so do sticks. Let's go on the offense together. Wolf-pack.com slash wedding. And if you're in favor of money in politics and you're in favor of corruption, that might be a red wedding for you. Watch the whole video of the volunteers down below. There's a link in the description box. It's in, up on TYT Politics. And go get involved. Do it today. It'll be the best thing you ever did. Okay, now I want to go to uh, Just Democrats because there's a story in the news about it. Kind of. <laughs> so, Politico has an interesting article about how uh, Democrats are not facing any primaries. Which is news to me because I'm, good. I'm pretty sure there's at least 15 primaries coming. Uh, I'm going to tell you about that in a second. First, let me introduce the article, the very poorly researched article for you guys. Uh, they write, Democrats have long been terrified that the Sanders-Clinton slugfest of 2016 would set off a prolonged civil war in the party, forcing incumbents to fight off primary challengers from the left in Senate and gubernatorial races. It hasn't happened. Really? So, later in the article, there's an oblique reference to groups that rose up uh, to do primary challenges, but he just erased it from history that they're not happening. So now, the reality is, they are happening. Let me show you the candidates. These are 16 Justice Democratic candidates. Ro Khanna, in, in near the middle there, is an incumbent. Everyone else is uh, now running in races. And yes, some of them are running against Republicans and, and are in an open seat, and there are no other Democrats in there. And if a Democratic establishment figure comes in, I guess they don't believe in unity. Right, some of them are in open, uh, are running against Republicans. And there's plenty of other Democrats in the race. And some are running against incumbents. Cory Bush in Missouri is running against Clay. Uh, you've got Alexandria Ocasio Cortez running against a very important incumbent, uh, Joe Crowley in New York. Paul Swearengen on the lower right uh, running against uh, Joe Manchin. So I, I don't know if uh, the writers of Politico don't possess a computer. It's called the Internet. You might want to Google it. Uh, and I'll tell you why they actually ignored uh, these primaries in a second. And the number one excuse they usually give is money. Ah, if you don't want to raise money, you're not a serious candidate. So, first of all, that's a horrible metric because you aid and abet corruption that way. And you encourage people who have received more legalized bribes. Okay. Oh, wow, a lot of big corporations gave you money, a lot of millions of dollars. Then you're a legitimate candidate. The unions gave you millions of dollars. Then you're a legitimate candidate. Okay, so if someone bought you off, you're a legitimate candidate. But what if we raise money from small donors? Yeah, but you can't raise a lot. Really? Because the Just Democrats, now that's the progressive strong wing of the Democratic Party. Yes, it's new. So, again, the guys in the Washington bubble might be like, oh, my God, something's new. We only like things that are old and part of the establishment. But you might want to look into it. How, well, to be fair, how much of those candidates raised and the, and the Just Democratic Party? Three million dollars. And you know who we got it from? We got it from you guys. Here, do it again. JusticeDemocrats.com slash win. JusticeDemocrats.com slash win. Small donors so that the Just Democrats work for you guys and they're uncorrupted. But Politico and Washington, they're uncomfortable with that. You can even tell it in the small ways. I'm going to show you the bigger ways, too. But in the small ways in the article. So, uh, Gabrielle uh, Debenedetti, who wrote this article, sorry for your horrible pronunciation of your name, uh, says, uh, Democrats have largely been spared of that predicament, referring to primaries. Look at the assumption there. Primaries are bad. It's a predicament for the Democratic Party. Well, how do you know it's a bad thing for the Democratic Party? The Republicans primary the hell out of each other, and all they do is win. 
They won the House. They won the Senate. They won the White House. They had 17 people in a primary on the Republican side. The Democrats were like, no, ever primary Hillary Clinton. She's the anointed one. How'd that turn out? It turns out 17 people in a primary led to a win. It didn't lead to a loss. It turns out primary Republicans led to more and more wins. How many houses have they lost now in, 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 in the state level? They've lost over a thousand seats the Democrats have at the state level. So why is it a predicament to primary people? Because your assumption is people in power are awesome and they should always maintain their power. You don't know that that's your assumption, but it is. Uh, further little uh, tidbits here. Another part of the article. Messy Democratic primaries are still expected in several House districts. See, primaries aren't productive and helpful and get you to a better candidate in an important part of democracy. They're messy. They're messy. You don't want primaries. Okay, well, we can strike a deal. Uh, how about we just take whoever's the most popular Democrat in the country now, and in 2020, you all promise, both the Democratic establishment and Politico and all the writers in Washington, and you all promise to say primaries are a bad thing, they're messy, they're a predicament, and we definitely, definitely shouldn't have them. Oh, who's the leading Democrat in the country now? Who's the most popular guy? All right, Bernie Sanders. Do we have a deal? Primaries are bad and messy, right? Oh, we don't have a deal, do we? You're going to run a whole heap of people to make sure Bernie Sanders doesn't get that nomination. Okay, so let's just understand that you're liars, and all you care about is protecting power. Let's just understand that, okay? So we believe in primaries. Yes, of course Bernie Sanders should be in a primary, and yes, other people should run against them. You know why? We're not afraid of the challenge, but we have winning ideas. We don't have losing ideas like the corporate Democrats who are like, oh, I got a great idea. As Barney Frank once told one of our reporters, you know what, you want the Republicans to take 100% of the bank money? We should take 20% and they should take 80%. What a genius idea, corporate Democrat. A perpetual losing strategy. So, no, if, if, I can't wait for that mess if you think that's a mess in terms of primaries. We, we are consistent, you are not. So now let's go more to the heart of the story. They write, most filing deadlines are still months away, and so insurgents who aren't currently on the radar could still launch late challenges. On whose radar? They're right there. They raised all that money. They're going to raise more money. Uh, they've got all these volunteers. We just did a poll in West Virginia. Joe Manchin's underwater. He's at 46%. How many times have I read articles about if a prime, if an incumbent is under 50%, that's a really bad sign. But if it's about one of their beloved establishment guys, I don't see it. I see it. I don't see it. I don't hear it. What, what poll? No, what candidate? There's a candidate against him? Paul G. Swearingen did a Reddit. It was one of the most popular Reddits in history. I don't see it. No, popular support. <laughs> did she get it, 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 raise any good corporate money? She hasn't raised any corporate money. No, not legitimate. Not legitimate. They go on. Meanwhile, liberal challenges to Senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Claire McCaskill of Missouri have so far failed to gain traction. Failed to gain traction with who? With you. Why did they fail to gain traction with you? Because you think if you take corporate money, you're awesome and you're winning. How did that work out for Hillary Clinton? How has it worked out for the entire Democratic Party? But if you don't take corporate money, uh, you fail to gain traction. I'm going to write a... Not only am I going to write a piece... In essence, crapping on you, but I'm going to crap on you so hard that I'm not even going to mention your name because God forbid I should give you any publicity. I want to smother you and make sure there's no oxygen in the room for any any change because I love Washington. Now the guys who write these stories and their editors, they don't know that they love Washington. They live in Washington, almost all of them. All their friends are Democrats and some Republicans and lobbyists and consultants, and they live in that bubble. They don't know it. I swear to you, they're not bad guys. They don't know it. They think, well, incumbents are fantastic. Power is awesome. Corporate money is the one metric we should use. It's in their heads. It's in their heads. They don't even know it's in their heads. More quotes. None of the many Democratic senators running in liberal states in 2018, such as Delaware's Tom Carper, Maryland's Ben Cardin, Minnesota's Amy Klobuchar, Rhode Island's Sheldon Whitehouse, or Washington's uh, Maria Cantwell, have seen any reason to sweat their own positions. Now, finally, we get to something that's true. That's true. And this is basically rubbing your face in it. See? These uh, incumbents, Democratic incumbents, in really blue states, they don't have to worry about any of their positions. They can take the corporate money and do whatever they want, and they can still please their donors, because you didn't primary them. <laughs> but actually, you are. You're primarying some of them. But it doesn't count. 
I'm not going to mention it. It's so sorry. And listen to what they're saying there. If you want them to change their positions or actually hold progressive positions, why is it that in red states, Republicans get to elect monsters like Roy Moore, the most right-wing guys imaginable and some not imaginable? And in the bluest of states, no, 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 no. Don't challenge corporate Democrats. My God, they might have to take popular positions then. Okay. Final quote. But on the other side, with so much of the party's grassroots money flowing to anti-Trump efforts and candidates, there's so far no organized effort to funnel campaign cash or political support to potential Democratic challengers. Or there is, but either I didn't want to bother looking it up, or I looked it up and I thought, ah, I don't care, let me help my incumbent establishment friends by pretending they don't exist. Guys, there's only one way to prove them wrong. Because they're never, ever going to give anybody credit. Progressives? No way. The, I, look, the reality is that mainstream media has enormous disdain for progressives. No matter what you do, how much money you raise, how many volunteers you have, any other kind of metric, it doesn't matter. They have disdain for you. The right wing, oh my God, they call us right wing. They say we have liberal bias. Right wing, we bow down to you. Establishment, oh, they love, got nothing but love for them. But when it comes to progressives, they can't stand you. So there's only one way to show them. Beat them. <laughs> We're not going to have any goddamn beer summits. Okay? We go run those primaries. Go to justicedemocrats.com slash win right now. Okay? With volunteer, donate, do whatever you got to do. Find your favorite candidates. Give to all of them, give to some of them. Do whatever you think is necessary. Don't let these establishment guys keep running this party into oblivion. This is how they lost the Trump. This is how they lost all those seats. Don't let them make that mistake again. The country is deeply progressive. You run on those positions, you run uncorrupted, and you win. Let's go out there and show them what we got, Young Turks. I'm going to rule against Siri. Okay. Um, it, I don't use Siri. No one actually uses Siri. And every time you press that button for a little too long. I know. Siri. How can I help you? Just shush. It happened yeah. earlier in the post game. I'm so know. over Siri. So yeah. over, and also, Sierra's kind of a bitch. She's, you know what? She is kind of a bitch. Okay. You know why? Okay, first of all, no one enjoys or is excited about setting their alarm clock to 6 a.m. But you know who is excited? Fucking Siri. She just asked me that. Oh. She's like, do you want me to set your alarm clock for 6.30 a.m.? Like, no, no, I don't. No, no, watch. Yeah, she's fucking eager to do it. Like, yeah. she's a weirdo. Watch. It's set my alarm for 4 a.m. I don't think it is. I didn't find any appointments for tomorrow at 4 a.m. Shall I click? You, you know you're on air, bitch. Like, what's okay. just going on? Okay, She's but like, usually... I shall now fuck with you. <laughs> so usually I'll be like, set the alarm for 6 a.m. She'll be like, okay, I turned it off. And I, it's like, why are you so excited? <laughs> Hey, Jack, what's up? And I want to do a YouTube live clip, but not live. Go. Robbie Canal, he calls his work urban and beautiful. I didn't go out to be a street artist or to make posters. I was just going to tell I was bad enough. It didn't matter. It was like a form of minor civil disobedience, even. You know, like, fuck. How about your higher ground? Power operates to self-replicate itself to maintain the status quo so it stays in power. When you go to do something like this to express yourself in public about an issue you care about, make sure you pick a bigger weapon. And the weapon is knowledge. The one thing about street art is not like I put up my posters to change anybody's mind about anything. The difference between propaganda and the kind of art I do is propaganda is telling people what to think. The way the art works, where the art works is between the time you see it and the time you figure it out for yourself. I'm an optimist. I might have made a lot of ugly things in the world with people who are supposed to be that alone. Not for them. <laughs>
hanging out with you guys. A um, couple of quick tweets, then we got to go. Uh, Eddie writes in, I love when Jen gives it these inspirational videos. Thank you, Eddie. Appreciate that. And I am Socks says, the messier the primary, the better, in my opinion. Agree with that as well, Mr. Sock. Uh, Elizabeth Marshall and Philip Wallstrom are our members of the day. Members make this show possible. Uh, so, tytnetwork.com slash join. I'm pretty sure we're giving you a perspective that you're not getting in the mainstream media. Uh, I don't remember them going ballistic that uh, progressives are not getting a fair shake on CNN. Pretty sure they have Dana Loesch on his head. Okay. All right. What's up? Anna? All right. CBS has decided to part ways with its senior counsel. In fact, this is executive counsel uh, who formerly worked at CBS and was promptly fired after she shared her opinion in regard to the shooting that took place in Las Vegas. Haley Gethman Gold is her name, and she had been with CBS for a little under a year. And uh, apparently she felt the need to share her opinions about the victims of this mass shooting and essentially said that she didn't really care for them. Uh, let me give you her exact statement. She said, if they, if they wouldn't do anything when children were murdered, I have no hope that repugs will ever do the right thing. I'm actually not even sympathetic because country music fans are often Republican gun toters. So the first part of her statement is something that, you know, we have heard a number of people say, uh, we've even made that argument using different words. But the second part of her statement is what got her in trouble, showing that she has no sympathy because these are country music goers who probably support, um, you know, no gun legislation. It's not good. So uh, they fired her immediately, and uh, here are some screenshots of what her posts look like. Um, and then here is a statement from CBS. A spokesperson said the following, this individual who was with us for approximately one year violated the standards of our company and is no longer an employee of CBS. Her views as expressed on social media are deeply unacceptable to all of us at CBS. Our hearts go out to the victims in Las Vegas and their families. I have a mixed reaction to this story, and I'll tell you why. Because did she say the right thing? Of course not. And, and you don't know the... First of all, you don't know the politics of those people. Second of all, it doesn't matter what their politics is. You should have sympathy for anyone who's a victim. So that's not debatable. That's not an interesting conversation. And and I understand that CBS mm -hmm. had to do what they did because her topic, her comments were too over the top. And I'll apply the same standard for right wingers mm -hmm. uh, as as this person who is clearly on the left, uh, which is, hey, you know, Facebook is public as a. As a person who has a job that's somewhat public facing, she's not a government official or anything like that, but you should think that through and know that your company's probably going to have to do something if you say something uh, that outrageous. The only reason why I have any mixed feelings is that uh, Republicans do this all the time, and they do it systematically, and and their their actions are so much worse than her words. So Republicans make sure that we don't have any gun control. Early in the year, they took away legislation that would prevent people from, who were mentally ill from getting guns. These people are so mentally ill, the government has adjudicated and their family, friends, everybody agrees that they can't get a social security check. They can't be trusted to with their own money. But the Republicans said, oh, let's just give them guns. It's okay to give them guns. They can't have a dollar, but they can have guns. They think that people on the terrorist watch list should be able to buy guns. Why? Because they get paid by the NRA. Okay. So their actions in allowing uh, this country to be awash with uh, weaponry. I mean, the guy in mm -hmm. Vegas had uh, this what? thing that uh, for $99 you could buy that allows you to fire auto your weapon automatically uh, with hundreds of bullets at a time. Okay? That's legal. That's legal. Why? Because people who are atrocious uh, corporate shills for the NRA, including some Democrats, allow that. And then we die. So I find their actions to be far more deplorable than what she said. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand why CBS did what they did, but they're always a panic. Like, you have to bend over backwards for Republicans. If a liberal ever says anything wrong, gone instantly. No one ever defends her, and we're done with it. And her career is done, and, and she has no allies whatsoever. <laughs> Republicans do outrageous things, say outrageous things. They get elected president. Everybody has their, all the, the entire Republican Party has their back, and they never back down. 
So yeah. look, I, I agree with you 100% when it comes to, you know, the questionable policies that those on the right continuously support and how, uh, you know, any type of aggressive criticism of those who support, you know, more, you know, <laughs> abilities to buy guns, um, you know, those people deserve to get criticized. There's no question about it. But at the same time, and I think we both agree on this as well, look, you're part of the left. I'm, I'm guessing she identifies as a Democrat, considering the way she referred to Republicans. And as a Democrat, you know, you're supposed to be an individual who supports and really uh, values tolerance. And so... These are victims. These are people that were gunned down. A, you don't know what their political identity is. Just because they're at a country music festival doesn't mean that they're 100% Republicans. Just because they're Republicans doesn't mean that they support, you know, um, any type of legislation uh, that would make it easier to obtain guns. So she just completely generalized about those people. And besides which, it doesn't matter. Even if they have or hold those political beliefs, you don't act as if, you know, shooting and killing them isn't that big of a deal. Who cares? I have no sympathy. That's just, it's just not the right thing to say. And it, it goes beyond being offensive. It, it shows a certain level of, you know, heartlessness that is, you know, I wouldn't want to work with her. I wouldn't want to be, you know, sitting beside her while she makes those types of statements, and I wouldn't defend her. So, I don't know. Look, whenever a, a liberal uh, says, and that was one wrong sentence, the world comes down on them, including us. And I, I said it, Anna said it, rightfully so, right? Mm -hmm. One wrong sentence, and you're eliminated forever. Uh, Kurt Schilling can say anything he wants as a Republican supporter for everything. He's a lunatic who used to be a Red Sox. I don't know why I picked that. Sheriff David Clark. I can name you a thousand examples. Donald right. Trump. Uh, they, could, they could say, they could grab women, they could do anything, they could take actions, and there's never any consequences. So what I'm tired of is the uneven playing field. So half of her statement is absolutely right. If they wouldn't do anything when children were murdered, I have no hope that Republicans will ever do the right thing. That is absolutely right. That is not what I'm criticizing our firm, okay? So an uneven playing field where if the left goes outside of the lines for one sentence, eliminated forever, okay? The right wing have no lines, have no uh, uh, barrel. And, and, it, and you know what that winds up doing? It winds up dragging the entire political spectrum in Washington, not the country, but in Washington, to the, to the right. You're right about that. And so I'm sick of the double standard. No, so I next guess. time any Republican says any wrong sentence, I hope that the right-wingers who are outraged by the story will join us in saying they should immediately be fired. Immediately fired, right? Right? Wait, wait, wait. Anna, I thought they were for freedom of speech. I know. I thought if they're uh, low some pricks on the right wing were getting paid twenty thousand dollars a speech, that uh, they have every right to it. Right, freedom of speech. Doesn't she have a freedom of speech? Oh, you don't care about her freedom of speech. That's interesting. So we have principles that are consistent. You shouldn't say that. Of course, CBS has a right to terminate you if you go across the line like that. So right wingers, on the other hand, have no principles, have no consistency. And they will turn around tomorrow and say things way worse than this. And if you even criticize them, you use your speech to criticize them, they'll turn into special little snowflakes. who will say, oh my God, I'm being attacked. Where's my freedom of speech? So let's just keep it real. That's the state of affairs in America. One thing that I do want to add to it, though, is... The reason why there is an uneven playing field and the reason why Washington seems to be pushed further and further to the right is because, and we've said this before, Republicans are really good at doing something that Democrats are not good at, right? Republicans do not apologize. Republicans are relentless in their criticism. They latch onto something and they won't let it go. Hillary Clinton with the Benghazi thing. We did not stop hearing about Benghazi. We still hear about Benghazi. It's unbelievable. Whereas Democrats... They don't do the same thing. They don't use the same tactics. And they are incredibly apologetic. They are immediately apologetic. And that's, look, I, I don't know whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. Now, it's a bad thing when we're in a system where you have one party that is unapologetic. But at the same time, I don't want Democrats to turn into Republicans. I don't want them to latch onto non-issues as a way of criticizing and delegitimizing you know what the, someone. You're absolutely right. And I'll tell you who the, the culprits here are. It's generally the media. The media, who no matter what you do, will call it even. One liberal at one media organization said one wrong sentence, 
well, that uh, now we're going to call it even for all the all right madness, for all the neo Nazis, for all the people who say that we should hate Mexicans, we should hate Muslims, or we should hate Jews. I said we're going to call it even. I, I I can't tell what's worse, right? And so what do they do? They encourage liars. They encourage bad behavior. And they say if you're a Republican or a right winger, you're almost always going to get away with it. But if you step one inch out of your lane as a liberal, you'll be eliminated forever. So it's the media's fault that we have this uneven playing field. If they had the same standard for the right wingers, then fine, no problem at all. But they don't. They bend over backwards and go, oh my God, don't call me a liberal. Right wing, you can say anything you like. I've seen it a thousand times. And it's, 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 it's hurting the country. All right, uh, let's move on to a different angle in this shooting story. Hours following the mass shooting that occurred in Las Vegas, there were a number of fake news articles that were going viral on social media. Now, you could have found these articles on a number of different platforms, including uh, Google's trending news or Facebook's trending news. And unfortunately, uh, there was an orchestrated effort in order to push out false information or misinformation regarding the perpetrator of the mass shooting. So according to the New York Times, uh, when it came to Google, trolls from 4chan had spent the night scheming about how to pin the shooting on liberals. One of their discussion threads in which they wrongly identified the gunman was picked up by Google's top stories module and spent hours at the top of the site's search results for that man's name. So, uh, Oh, that's so funny, 4chan. (laughs) <laughs> so when the authorities are, the cops are trying to find the right guy, uh, hey, let's waste their time. Maybe the guy could murder more people while we're having fun on 4chan. That's so funny. You're so 15 years old. Or worse yet, you're a 35-year-old, and you're the saddest, saddest man alive. And, you know, I don't know what picture they use in that particular case. And God forbid if you pick the wrong guy and it's, it's an actual citizen it's, and it's not a meme, uh, then people are going to go chase that guy, and God knows what they're going to do. It's so funny when we encourage violence. We're such a crack up at 4chan. Yeah, and look, I know that in the past, 4chan or forums on 4chan have done things as practical jokes, and they do think it's funny. In this case, it appears to be an orchestrated effort to pin the blame on liberals. Like, oh, this is an anti Trump. Rachel Maddow watching hey, hey, Shooter, right? Hey, 4chan, thank you for admitting that you're on the wrong side. Uh, so anyone who participated, and it's not everybody on 4chan did this, okay, for the folks who did it, right? Uh, you have to lie about how it's uh, Rachel Maddow supporting liberal because you know that uh, likely it's a right-winger, and it's the right-wingers who don't want any gun control, who encourage the guys like this guy to buy 42 weapons, who celebrated it, that, and, and you know that you're on the wrong side. That's why you have to lie. See, if you weren't on the wrong side, you wouldn't have to lie. But you do that, and you do it on purpose, because you know you're wrong. So that's fine. Thank you for the admission that uh, being a conservative equals being a dirtbag. So that's why you had to lie about liberals, because you don't actually have any goods on them. Okay, thank you for the admission. What's next? Oh, damn. Salty Jank. I'm, I'm enjoying Salty Jank today. Okay. Okay? All right, because I'm feeling very light and fluffy, so... <laughs> Not me. Not you, me. You take over the, the salty part. All right. Right-wingers lie pathologically. They do it all the time, and our stupid media calls it even. When do you ever see a left-wing organization or a blog or a forum just make stuff up and go, oh, the right-wing did a mass murder? Are you kidding me? If they did 1% of that, the rest of the media would rise up in their fury and go, look at these despicable progressives. How dare they do this, right? A shooter once thought of Bernie Sanders. Oh, my God, it's Bernie Sanders' fault. Now, these guys, they lie for a living. That's what they do. I don't know if they think it's funny. They know that they're wrong and pathetic, so they do it. And, and everybody's like, oh, okay, well, that's the right wing. That's okay. That's okay. Let's just keep calling it even. Yeah, look, it's obviously not okay, but... Propaganda has always been around. What makes this situation different is that more and more people are relying on social media in order to get their news. Now, some of, some of those people get their news on social media because of its convenience. Most people are on social media throughout the day anyway. But um, there's also this uh, lack of trust toward traditional forms of media. And so it's kind of crazy when it comes to younger generations, there's more of a reliance on social media. And these are individuals who know how to basically play the algorithm game. 
right? This is all about algorithms. How is it that their, their fake news stories manage to get the attention that it does? They know how to optimize, you know, certain tags and certain headlines in order for these uh, stories to go viral. So that was Google. Now let's go on to Facebook. Before we do, let me just explain a little bit more detail on that Google part. So how did they get the story in the Google's top module? Uh, well, since they uh, picked the wrong guy and they knew it's the wrong guy, uh, that guy has no search results about him. So it, it, search results about him being the shooter go to the top for his name. I know. Which then is how they game the system into having everybody think that it's a liberal guy that did the shooting, etc. And they think that's clever. And I get that that it is interesting in strategy if you're a pathetic, pathological liar who likes to waste people's time while we're looking for a mass murderer, okay? And if you think that that's a fun game, okay, mission accomplished, nice job, okay? But there is no equivalent of that on the left. There are monsters in the world, and they're almost exclusively on the right-wing side. Now, you're not going to hear that in the mainstream media because they're too scared to tell you the truth. But look at it over and over and over again. Who are the ones lying? Who are the ones making things up? Who are the ones distracting the authorities? Who are the ones wrongly accusing people? The right wing, the right wing, the right wing. Again here. So when it comes to Facebook, uh, again, according to the New York Times, an official safety check page for the Las Vegas shooting prominently displayed a post from a site called Alt-Right News. The post incorrectly identified the shooter and described him as a Trump-hating liberal. Some users saw a story on a trending topic page on Facebook for the shooting that was published by uh, Sputnik, a news agency controlled by the Russian government. The story's headline claimed incorrectly that the FBI had linked the shooter to Daesh, a terror group also known as ISIS. So oh, by the way, right wing, uh, enjoy your Russian uh, comrades. So you guys are uh, thinking along similar lines. Uh, Putin wants us to go right wing and love Trump. You want us to go right wing and love Trump. So uh, way to wait, way to work for uh, the Russians. You must be so proud. I remember decades of right wingers talking about, oh, Democrats, they're with the Russians. Democrats aren't tough enough on the Russians. Now you're the Russians, bitch. So, so how do you like them apples? So I, I just want to make a quick comment about the link to ISIS because ISIS did claim responsibility. I mean, now this guy wasn't linked to ISIS at all, but ISIS still claimed responsibility for it, which I thought was interesting. We still don't know what his motive was. He didn't leave a note behind as far as we know so far. You know why? So sometimes the, the shooters uh, or the guys uh, who are doing the killings, especially in Europe, are linked to ISIS. And sometimes they have no links at all. And so the Orlando shooter, who had a lover inside the, the gay nightclub that he shot up, happened to be Muslim. Before he went on, he, he didn't want to say, I'm gay and I'm bitter and I shot up the place. So he said, oh, yeah, sure, I'm doing it because I'm Muslim. And ISIS jumped all over. And, and everybody, the right wing, helped them, helped ISIS by propagating that he worked with ISIS when there was actually no evidence that he in any way took a tangible step with ISIS or worked with them. And our authorities say that, right? So ISIS thought, they'll give us credit for anything. What does it matter well, if the guy's Muslim or alive? A paddock? Yeah, sure. He did it for ISIS. And the right wing's yeah. like, yes! Let me help ISIS more by propagating that. So I think that's relevant because just because ISIS wants to claim responsibility, I mean, they want to take credit. You know, that's like a badge of honor for them. They're proud of that. And the and right so, wing is their best friend when they do that's that. That's right, exactly. So anytime they claim responsibility, it doesn't mean that that individual was linked to ISIS. All right, and then finally, uh, Google, Facebook, all of them, they're saying, no, it's our algorithm issue. We're, we're working on it. We're working on it. Okay, whatever. Your algorithm sucks. And obviously you can't, I mean, these are the, the best and brightest engineers and coders and, and people in tech you could ever imagine, and they still can't figure out how to avoid these stories going viral. But, I, I actually don't agree with that. Uh -huh. And so, look, and I think, and so, I think it is, and by the way, let me just put my conflict of interest out there, okay? So, uh, we, we have, we're partners with Google and Facebook, so it's fair to point that out, okay? And I'm doing, I'm pointing it out. But look, you, the New York Times article makes a great point. The algorithm, and they have to use an algorithm. There's not, six, there's not there's not 60 billion people on the earth to collate all these search results, okay? They must use an algorithm. So when they use an algorithm, even if they have humans who are then going to correct it, there is some period of time between the algorithm picking that news story up and putting it to the top 
and a human coming going, oh my god, no, that's not a legitimate news story, taking it off. Mm -hmm. And the 4 chance of the world, or the people at 4chan who specifically did this, go, yeah, I see, that's a good way to game the system. And there's an extra trick in there. They then turn around and blame Google and Facebook and Twitter and all these other things for it. And they help to destroy the internet. Because you know what? People, New York Times writes a story. It's a good story. It's got all the facts right, etc. Okay? Then, the rest of the media picks it up and goes, you see that? You gotta do something about shutting down Facebook and Google. Not shutting them down completely, but we gotta get in there and we gotta suppress them a little bit, etc. Well, the, you know, our legislators want to go in and, and start regulating uh, social media to prevent the spread of, of fake news. But, you know, uh, you have legitimate concerns when it comes to that because... Pew Research found that two-thirds of Americans get some of their news, at least some of their news, from social media. And social media is incredibly powerful in pushing out information that politicians don't like and that the mainstream media refuses to report. And so does Congress have an interest in, you know, squashing that as much as possible? Absolutely. And so I'm very cognizant of that, and I'm concerned about that as well. But that being said, this is a real issue. And... I think one of the biggest problems is that the country lacks media literacy, being able to tell the difference between a legitimate news source and an illegitimate news source. And then even that conversation gets, conversation gets very tricky because what if an independent, legitimate, and credible news source emerges? And since it doesn't have any name recognition, recognition does it mean that people just think, oh, this is not legitimate? No, but that's exactly right, Anna. So mainstream media and television is uh, the best friend for... Uh, people in power. They they had gatekeepers that strictly controlled, and if you criticize the establishment, you will be removed from television. So we've seen it happen over and over again, and it literally happened to me, and I, somebody, the, the guy who runs MSNBC told me to my face, so I know it for a fact. So when they see a story like this, they're like, perfect. The internet's killing us. Facebook and Google are eating our lunch, so this is a great opportunity to attack them and they regain power. And so those guys that did this, whether it's on 4chan or anywhere else, they think that it's funny and they get to use the internet. And they, my guess is they love the internet like we do, right? But what they don't know is you're doing untold damage to the internet because you're letting the establishment then turn around and go, the internet is not trustworthy. It's filled with fake news. Let's figure out a way to reduce its power, shut it down, regulate it, and make sure you take the freedoms away. So, this, Anna, you're right. This is an incredibly difficult issue. It is real. There is fake news out there. It does deceive people. But there's no easy answers. And, and, and I think that the solutions that I am very afraid of the solutions that Congress is going to come up with and what the rest of the media is going to suggest to make sure that competitors don't get the upper hand on that. Right. We got to take a break. Let's do that. And when we come back, uh, updates on the referendum in Spain. Uh, there were huge rallies. I'll give you the details on that and more. Exclusive members coverage of 280 Post came live from Rebel Headquarters in sunny Los Angeles. So, Jason, the air is electric after yesterday's post game. So, I was talking about Miami. You know, the only thing about this, Jason, is we've heard the Miami story. I'm looking at Kasparian's interest here. She's given him the cordial glance to the side, but I just don't know if it's really there. Oh, that's where the vagina is. Oh, okay. uh, that joke landed hey, like Apollo 13 there. Kasparian gives up the courtesy off, gives up the Edwin way. Had you had sex at that point when you took that class? Anyways, so, hold a minute. He's found an opening. Is he finding his way to come back, Jason? I thought, Jay, is Jay Guga coming back? You With a comment, no one would have seen this coming. And he's in the mood, and there's some music in the background, and he's got the sideburns, yeah. he has the long hair. <laughs> in her he won't find himself. There's no way he's ready to. I mean, I've explained. He's got it. It's unbelievable. Every dog has his day, and this dog is having the best day of his damn life. <laughs> that was an outstanding post game. If tonight's post game is anything like last night's, we're in for another one. Exactly week. right, Francis. And don't forget to check out the TYT post game after the Young Turks every weekday on tytnetwork.com slash members live. 
MSNBC opportunity was an experiment. And Phil and host beat CNN headline news go by. At some point, they want to give me a show. Every single year, that comes out of our paycheck. We put it in, and you're saying we were suckers. When you, as a host, tells someone you're interviewing to shut up, that's going to raise a red flag. That guy needed an all glass and shut up. <laughs> if President Obama's doing the wrong thing, I'm not going to tell you that he's doing the right thing so I can, quote, support him. He says to me, you won't believe the meeting that I just had. The head of MSNBC talked to me, and they want him off the air. Jake took an incredible risk. Are we supposed to challenge the government? That's the role of the media. The Democrats and the Republicans are, are here to screw you. Uh, and who on the air is saying it? I wouldn't have done what you did. That if I'm going to be a talk show host, it'd be the biggest talk show host in the country. I don't think anyone else does it better. I don't think anyone's even close. Before you know it, I'll be back on your TV doing an actual show. I guarantee it. I'm a country music fan and progressive. The audience is by no means a monolith, especially younger fans. You like country music? Uh, I like country music. Uh, <gasps> I do. I, about a third of my uh, iTunes is uh, is country music. Mm -hmm. A lot of it old school, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah. A third? I think so. What? I've got a lot of Johnny Cash on there. I got the Highwaymen, and then I got stuff that's a little bit more folk. Uh, music. I've got Devil Goes Down to Georgia, uh, etc. And my, uh, my, I got my son into it now. Mm -hmm. He likes country music too. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. And Vance says the problem that faces our country is the sad truth. Democrats want to be Republicans without the stigma of being Republican. So for the corporate Democrats, that's unfortunately very true. All right. What's next, Anna? All right. The Spanish region of Catalonia held a referendum recently over the past weekend, and the referendum, of course, has to do with the idea of separating from Spain and the central government of Madrid. Now, before I give you the details on how that referendum went and the insane number of people that were injured due to police brutality, uh, I want to share the most recent update, which involves the king of Spain and a very rare speech that he gave today, which was 
rather forceful in regard to uh, being against the separatists and, uh, you know, making statements calling for unity in Spain. Now, King Philippe VI of Spain accused the region's separatists or separatist leaders of inadmissible disloyalty and of creating a situation of extreme gravity that threatened the country's constitution and unity. He also said that with their irresponsible conduct, they can even put at risk the economic and social stability of Catalonia and the whole of Spain. Now, quickly, uh, let's talk about the economic issues at play here. If Catalonia were to separate from Spain, Spain would lose about 20% of its economy. Some of the most uh, wealthy people live in Catalonia. There is an income or wealth redistribution issue there where, uh, you know, these wealthy earners obviously pay more in taxes. Those taxes are redistributed to, um, you know, the poorer communities amongst uh, the Spanish. And another thing to keep in mind is that Catalonia actually uh, has or owes a huge portion of the public debt. And so one argument is that if they separate, they wouldn't be obligated to pay that debt back to the central government. So those are some of the uh, key issues at play here. Now, earlier in the day uh, today, pr protesters blocked dozens of roads across Catalonia. Farmers used their tractors to cut off highways and demonstrators shut down some of the main roads in Barcelona. The strike, which was backed by the regional government of Catalonia, also brought the subway system and bus network to a standstill during most of the working day. Now, I want to be clear about something. Although uh, the day that they voted, unfortunately, ended in turmoil and violence, mainly because of the police response to those protesters, today was largely peaceful. Um, it seemed more as a celebratory day as opposed to a day met with violence. So here is uh, some video kind of showing you what it looked like. And these are individuals who are, again, calling for the separation of Catalonia from Spain. And the people of Catalonia, and protesters or voters, were never violent. It was the cops who were violent. Right. And, and often the states uh, throughout the world will do this. They'll say, oh, we have to, we're worried about the violence. Well, you're the one who started it in the first place. So, look, um, the, the court in, in Spain said that this vote was not legal. I, I, I'm not a constitutional expert in Spain, so I don't know if that's true or untrue and if that was a correct ruling or not. But I do know that the government's reaction was disastrous. Absolutely. So if the if the vote is not legal anyway, and the courts have ruled that it's not valid, why do you have to go in there with batons and shooting rubber bullets at people who are trying to vote and grab them by the hair and drag them out of voting booths? Are you insane? I mean, we're what talking a terrible about counterproductive. Uh, response. So, and, and we're not just talking about like young, healthy people that were met with violence. There was, uh, you know, footage showing elderly people being dragged out of uh, voting booths and and that type of behavior, which was uncalled for. And there were even um, some of the separatist leaders who admitted to the press that this is essentially a non-binding vote, considering how the courts have reacted to it. Um, but. You know, the central government of Spain uh, really reacted aggressively to this referendum. Now, going back to the referendum, what happened? About 42 percent of uh, voters showed up to the polls. But part of the reason why voter turnout was so low was because of, you know, the intimidation tactics by uh, Spain's central government. Now, national police seized millions of ballot papers and also sealed schools and other buildings to be used as polling stations. And... Uh, because of the police uh, violence, around almost 900 people were injured, and that's according to Catalan uh, officials. So if you wanted to make the point to the people of Catalonia that, hey, don't worry, Spain is a democracy and you'll have full freedom, liberty, and rights here, boy, you picked a curious way to do it. Uh, oh, you're trying to vote? Okay, bar the doors, rip up the ballots, beat the people up trying to vote. That is not a, a winning strategy to win hearts and minds. Uh, even if, and especially, especially if you claim to value democracy, because that means that, you know, anyone that you disagree with, you will meet them with violence. That is not democracy. Yeah, so. And, and so, look, it is a very hard issue, and it's an issue that a lot of countries uh, struggle with, and in the case of Spain, they have 17 different regions. If they all break up, uh, if Catalonia goes, God knows what goes next, and so it, the UK has to deal with this with Scotland from time to time. Uh, there's plenty of countries in the Middle East that have to deal with this. It's a 
issue that we all have to grapple with as a world, and if there are no easy answers. What I know what the answer isn't, which is violence by the state. Yeah. So let them have their vote, and then adjudicate legally whether it is valid or not valid, and let the consequences flow from there. And, and it might turn out that, yes, some countries that we are used to wind up breaking apart and getting smaller and smaller. And later, they might come back together. But look what happened in Europe. And I know that it goes back and forth, but uh, they, there was war, endless wars in Europe. Hundreds of years of war, thousands of years of war, and one war was literally a hundred years, right? right? And then they came back together in the European Union, and now again, you know, UK leaving. So the answer is definitely not violence. It's democracy and, and, a, and a legal process. So Spain, if you believe in your democracy and you believe in your legal process, let that reign and then uh, then you might have more credibility with the people of Catalonia. Absolutely. And, and just real quick, uh, because I do want to do this story justice, so just to give you some historical context, this is not an issue that just arose. Um, there was a similar vote back in 2014, and uh, the majority of those who did make it out to the polls were uh, largely in favor of separating. The region held a symbolic poll in 2014 in which 80% of voters backed complete secession, but only 32% of the electorate turned out. And the Spanish government is arguing that, hey, our constitution indicates that if you guys want to separate, if you want to do this, you need to open up that vote to all Spaniards. Um, and, you know, they, they mention uh, the Spanish constitution in order to make that argument, and it was revised in 1978. But there was also something super interesting that happened in the early 2000s. So back in uh, 2006, um, there was essentially an agreement by the parliament in Spain and the parliament in Ca Catalonia that Catalonia would be its own separate nation. But then four years later, the courts came in and they're like, no, no, th that's not going to happen. And so they essentially said, you guys are a nat Catal Catalans are a nationality, but you are not your own nation. And so it's gone back and forth further, you know, irritating people and frustrating people. So as Jake mentioned, it's a difficult situation. It's very complicated, but that is currently what's going on in Spain right now. And, and Franco, uh, back in the day, uh, oppressed Catalonia, and that's how it began in the first place, so let's not make that mistake. Okay, so guys, we got to go for the Sirius Satellite Radio audience. We're going to come right back because we have to do a story about net neutrality and how they're trying to kill it. Uh, and then I've got an overtime for the members as well uh, with two extra stories. So if you want to get all of that, tytnetwork.com slash join to become a member and get all the content. All right, for the online audience, we'll be back in a minute.
back on the Young Turks, Jenk and Anna. Um, James Wiley says, thank you, Jenk, for the highway mention. Made me realize I'm not the only one who still likes them. That's right. Um, you're not. And Bart, you're on our side? Okay, good. Uh, and on one post game, you know what we should do that's super fun? Mm. We should go through my iTunes. Okay. Because you will love it, you will hate it. Uh, but you will be greatly amused by it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is a fascinating collection of music. Um, but not today, because today what do you have, Anna? Um, so, something happened during my run this morning Uh-oh. that I want to share. Oh, no. <laughs> I attract crazy people. Like, I really do. So, you don't want to miss it. All right. Yeah. That's tytnetwork.com slash join to become a member. Let me read you two last, uh, or one last uh, tweet here. Tim Joyce says, Threaten the country's unity. That would seem to be rather the point of an independence referendum. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, I don't know. I'm amused by that. You're right. It's kind of a weird insult. Uh, uh, I'm going to play golf. If you are threatening to play a ball, a game, with a stick and a ball. Yeah, that's right. I said I'm going to play golf. <laughs> anyway, you didn't need that analogy. We move forward. All right. The biggest threat to keeping the internet free and fair is this guy. His name is Ajit Pai, and he is the FCC chairman. He's also a gigantic douchebag. Now, uh, he used to be the lawyer for Verizon, a huge telecommunications company, and now he is the chairman of the FCC, the uh, regulatory body that is supposed to represent us, the consumers, and ensure that our best interests are in mind. But that doesn't seem to be the case because Ajit Pai wants to do away with net neutrality. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, the Senate has reconfirmed him as the chairman of the FCC, and that vote just took place. In a 52 to 41 vote, the U.S. Senate reconfirmed Pi to another term on the Federal Communications Commission. Now, Pi seeks to dismantle regulations that prevent Internet providers like Verizon, his former employer, from slowing traffic to websites whenever they wish. He's eager to roll back rules that stop providers from blocking online content at their discretion, and he opposes restrictions on carriers that prohibit them from accepting payments to speed up websites beyond that which their lesser competitors can afford. So understand that he is essentially going to open the floodgates for the same type of corruption that we're currently experiencing among our politicians, where uh, the biggest internet players, the ones that are already established and already extremely lucrative and profitable, would have more of a say over um, internet speeds than anyone else, uh, essentially squashing their competition. Ajit Pai thinks that's great, and he also thinks that, hey, you know what, a free market will kind of sort all that stuff out, which we all know is not the case. So uh, let's break this down further. So his idea is, well, uh, the internet's a little too free now, uh, so what we should do is uh, regulations. Now, he couches it in terms of, oh, I'm going to take away regulations from the Obama administration. But wait a minute, you're passing a new regulation that says that Verizon and AT&T and all the different internet providers can do uh, whatever they please and not protect the freedom of the internet where everything is as, as it's always been. So you are the one disrupting the market. You are changing the market. So please, for God's sake, at least be honest about it. Will it be the same rules? He says, well, it won't be, but we, I think the companies will voluntarily not discriminate against their competitors. Because that's what corporations do, right? They voluntarily don't compete with their competitors. That happens all the time. Can anyone really be that stupid, that He's naive? Not. He's not He's that not. stupid. He knows what the reality is, and you know, it's already happened, and luckily since we've had regulations in place, consumers and, you know, various companies have had protections against the type of, you know, terrible behavior that we would see if we rolled back net neutrality. So I want to give you some specific examples that should raise some eyebrows. Uh, let's go to graphic 29. So Verizon, again, Ajit Pai's former employer, T-Mobile and AT&T, for example, collectively blocked 241 million consumers from using Google Wallet several years ago because the service competed with one that each had a financial stake in, the unfortunately named ISIS Mobile Wallet. Oops. Okay. <laughs> so a lot going on there. Okay. So they 
like literally this is, to be fair to them uh, this is before the rise of ISIS in the Middle East so they thought it was a good idea to name something ISIS mobile wallet okay just bad luck on their part yeah yeah okay. it was a co -wiki. okay <laughs> now uh, but you know as Anna correctly stated, it is our opinion, hers and mine in this particular case, that Ajapai is a douche nozzle. Now, uh, but that opinion is informed by facts, and these are among those facts. We didn't wake up one day and think, boy, I'll think a random guy like Ajapai and dislike him. No, when someone says, no, these guys will not block their competitors, and we know for a fact that they already have, and logic indicates in order to maximize profit, they always will. Right. And we have abundant evidence of, to that effect, and you tell us, you know, just trust my former employer that paid me a lot of money earlier, and by the way, will very likely pay me even more later after I leave this office. No, we're not going to trust you. That's not how the government works. And you're supposed to look out for us and not the people who pay you, but that's not what Ajapai is doing. So I only gave you one example. There are more. Uh, five years ago, AT&T blocked certain iPhone users from accessing FaceTime unless they upgraded to more expensive data plans. So there's another example. And and if Ajit Pai has his way, uh, he would get rid of the regulations that prevent that type of predatory behavior. Also, oh, wait, I thought they would voluntarily give us everything for free. Aren't these non-profits? Oh, they want yeah. to maximize profit. Whoa. So, That's weird. I didn't see. Apparently, Ajipai didn't learn that in school. So keep in mind, there's a lot at stake. So net neutrality, of course, is the biggest issue here because these internet service providers will get to decide which websites and which uh, businesses they can slow down speeds for. But another issue is the price that you will end up paying for you know, services that you need, you know, essential services to keep you connected to friends, family members, work. Um, so you're going to pay more. And then uh, you are also not going to have as much of an option in terms of, let's say, where you get your news because of all of these monopolies, all of these telecommunications companies that have bought up all of these media organizations. The speeds for those websites will be fast, while the speed for independent news sites will be much slower because they don't want that competition. So a lot of uh, the right wing here is actually on the right side of the story, okay? Because uh, they also have websites and blogs and all the other things that they enjoy doing on the internet. The right wing is, uh, is familiar with the internet, and they like it, and they should. So this is one that... that almost the whole country agrees with. Uh, on the other side is these corporate powers and their lackeys like Ajit Pai and all the Republicans, the 51 Republicans, who just said, yes, please search and destroy the internet for us, Ajit Pai, because we all get paid by the internet providers and we're corrupt and we'd like to institute that corruption. Now, a conservative website pointed out to Ajit Pai, hey, wait a minute, you asked for public comment, and but it looks like there's hundreds of thousands of comments that came in that were fake comments from Russia. And Pi dismissed their concern. Yeah. Oh, you're conservatives, actual conservatives? I don't care about you. No, oh, look at this wonderful comments from Ru uh, Russia. Are they from Russia? Oh, well, what a wonderful coincidence. This Russia supporting the Trump administration again. Another coinkadink, okay? Yeah. So he, when he sees that and he dismisses it, you know what that means? He's not only dishonest, he knows he's dishonest. To the point of his dishonesty, um, there was 47,000 complaints pertaining to alleged net neutrality violations on the part of Internet providers. And what did the FCC do? They combated efforts to publicize them, especially before the, uh, the time period for public comments until it was over, okay? So they're like, oh, we don't want the public finding out what's actually happening because Ajit Pai is sitting there with a straight face telling people, no! They would never violate net neutrality. My beloved former employers and future employers would just do things that are good for everybody beyond the goodness of their hearts. But Ajit, you know that there's 47,000 complaints about doing them doing just that. Oh, is there? I was trying to hide that. No, no, no. One more thing. In 2013, when a Verizon attorney was asked in court about, hey, wouldn't you guys do, uh, you know, things that would advantage you and disadvantage your competitors like slowing down websites um in in 2013 that attorney said but for these rules we would be exploring those types of arrangements yes they admitted in legal papers of course 
We're going to look for a competitive advantage. And if the government is corrupt enough to give us a monopoly, we will, of course, use that monopoly to maximize our profits. Did we stutter? What, are we stupid? We're going to make less money? No, I bribe politicians that we made it legal. So I give them campaign donations. They find one of my employers. There's 330 million people in the country. You can't find one knucklehead who thinks that co co corporations are Mother Teresa and would voluntarily do the right things. And oh my God, I said, you got such a big position. Oh, mommy and daddy are so proud. Okay. And so you give him all these things. And then he goes, what, what 47,000 complaints? Verizon lawyers admitting, of course, they're going to do anti-competitive anti stuff and destroy the internet. Oh, oh golly gee, I must have missed that. So whether you're conservative or progressive or anywhere in the middle, this is the one thing we should all agree to. Protect the Internet because the establishment and the corruption is coming for it. In this case, it happens to be in the form of Ajit Pai and 51 Republican corrupt senators who back them because they get campaign donations to be corrupt. Don't let them destroy the Internet. Yep. And by the way... Um I feel like the first fact that supports the argument that he's a douchebag was the picture that we showed you. I mean, just look at just look at this guy. Just uh, so the first picture with the you know why right, face so he, alone. Yeah, <laughs> not on face, on mug alone, <laughs> on his mug, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so he does that thing with the Reese's. Because uh, he's so cool. Like he's such a cool guy, right? With his yeah. freaking Converse and his skinny jeans. Like, oh, I'm one of you guys. I'm gonna screw you over, but I'm one of you guys. No, you're not cool. Yeah. Okay, you're not invited to the club. <laughs> Whatever club. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, honestly, I don't, I'm, I'm not, not sure invited I'm to the club either, either. But still. Okay, still. but it, to Anna's point, like the Reese's thing is to get you to. It, it's meant to be endearing, right? Like, oh, that's oh, I like Reese's too, and he likes oh, and he's so he's so fun, right? No. Oh, he took away the internet. What a fun thing to do. Oops. All right. That's uh, enough for today's show, except for the fact that it's not. I got an overtime segment for you, and we got the post game where, again, Anna, I don't know if you got across that, I don't know the story, but runs into someone while jogging. Get all that, and, and by the way, I'm going to do the overtime uh, live for the members, too. It'll be after the post game. So, tytnetwork.com slash join. Oh, yeah. Bye-bye. Oh, bye-bye. <laughs>